1912, the Titanic made its maiden voyage, and it was pronounced by many that this was a ship that not even God could sink. And as you well know the story, it sunk. And there's a lesson here, if we could stop and realize it, they hit an iceberg that sunk with them. And as we're passing through this world, sin is the iceberg that will sink us. Now, do you remember there were a few that were able to get in lifeboats? And thank God, those few were even able to reach out and rescue others. Jesus Christ is the only lifeboat that we have. Sin will sink us and take us to eternal torment. But in Christ, there is safety. I want to commend this church for taking seriously the challenge of calling people to get in the lifeboat. I don't know of anything more important that we could do this week. You've made the plans, and thank you for inviting me to participate with you. But I know that you have put your time and effort into this already. And we hope and pray there are people that will get in this lifeboat this week. But you know what? If no one decides to get in the lifeboat, we're here also to encourage one another, do not get out of this lifeboat. It is astonishing how many people jump out of the lifeboat and go back into sin. And so may God help us in both ways that we can encourage one another to stay in the lifeboat and reach out to those who are sinking in sin. I've grown to love this church through the years of being here with you and think of you often and pray for you. And I'm thankful that Donna has come again. She rarely can travel with me. Must be something here she likes. This is the second time she's come here. Thank the deans for inviting us to be in their home. You will recognize the name Stephen Deaton. He worships where I am and has learned to love you folks, and he wanted to send his greetings. And then I know you're familiar with Connie Adams and the years are pulling him down. We need to keep him in our hearts and prayers, and his wife especially. They are struggling. When we finish this study tonight, we're going to take a few moments that you could ask questions about the lesson. If you think of something that's confusing or that needs to be clarified, or for any reason that you'd want to ask, we want to make ourselves open to do that. Make a note of it so that you can remember. And feel free then if you have questions. One of the great things that challenges us in our generation to get people in the lifeboat is there's an increasing number in our culture who have become agnostics who doubt God and atheists who deny God. And it seems that trend is growing. So I wanted to study with you first this week the lesson, Evidence God Exists. We do not believe in God because of some emotional feeling or because our grandparents believed in God. We need to know the rock-solid, indestructible evidence there is a true and living God. Now I want to study that with you tonight. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I want to study that passage with you in just a few minutes. You can have your Bible open there. Because the universe proclaims the existence of the true and the living God. But as I say, many are questioning that in our time. And people are asking, how can we really know that God exists? Is there any way that we can really prove that? Some of us can remember that in 1961, Russian cosmonaut Gagan, Gagarin rather, was the first to enter space. Nikita Khrushchev, the head of the Communist Party in Russia at that time, said that this man did not see God there. Well, no, we don't see God with our physical eyes, but does that mean there is no God? And what kind of evidence would be necessary to prove 
that we can know there is a true God. So I want to open our minds in this direction. There is evidence not involving sight and touch of many things. And not just the issue of God. There are things that exist that cannot be seen with a telescope. There are things that exist that cannot be seen with a microscope. Now what are some things in that regard? The atom was first discovered not by sight or touch, but scientists were able to see the effect of the atom. The simple effect of it convinced them that it was there. And so they kept searching and searching. So they knew something was there. There was evidence when they could not see or touch the atom. How about your intelligence? Could we put your intelligence in a test tube? No, we couldn't do that. But seriously, are you an intelligent person? Well, sure. Did you learn the ABCs? I probably think you did. Did you go to school? You're an intelligent person. But nobody can put your intelligence in test to do so that we can see and touch it in that physical sense. But it is reality. What about love? Do you love your husband? Do you love your wife? Do you love your children and grandchildren? Is that love reality or is that just some vague emotion and there's no reality there? No, love is a reality. You cannot see and touch it. You can see the effects of it, just like with the atom. Now then, I used to teach history in high school, and so we study about ancient people. You've heard of Julius Caesar, but did you ever shake his hand? I'm sure you know who George Washington is, but do you ever remember a time that you heard him speak? I can remember doing homework when I was a young child, and We'd study about people like that, and we would ask my mother, uh, did you know him? She would indignantly say, no, I did not. But she believed that he existed, and I do too. And you do too. They left evidence of their existence. So there is overwhelming evidence that God also existed, and that he exists now. And even that he will always exist. And I want to study that evidence tonight, starting with Psalm 19. Let's please open here, and we will begin to think about the undeniable evidence of the true and the living God. Psalm 19. God's glory is proclaimed by the creation. And in the first four verses, David focuses on that proclamation as a message that goes to all men in all the world. No one is exempt from this message. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. So day and night the heavens proclaim the existence of God. Now before I go further, have you ever encountered someone that would say this? I can't believe in a God that would condemn people to hell and they live in remote places and they don't even know there's a God. How can I believe in such a God? I don't believe in such a God either. I don't believe in a God that hides himself and then throws people into hell because they can't find him. Look what the writer said in the next verse. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. People in the most remote place who look up can know somebody made these heavens and even this earth and even my body. And when they begin to search for that true and living God, the Bible teaches that God opens a way for them to find Him and know Him. He is not hiding from anyone. Let's notice in the next part of it here, he focuses on the majestic sun, one part of the heavens, 
that provides evidence for the truth of the living God. Now continuing verse 4, in them in the heavens had he set a tabernacle for the sun. What's another word for a tabernacle? A tent, right? So this is poetry. The sky is like a tent where the sun lives, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. If we go to a wedding, we chatter, we visit, we laugh. But when the bridegroom comes out, every eye goes there, and the bride appears, and the audience is quiet. And so what it's saying, in the same way, when you look up into the heavens, it cannot escape your attention that the sun is now shining. And it's compared to going to an athletic event, and there's some hero on the field. The sun is the hero up in the heavens. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. So he starts, the sun starts on one side of the horizon and goes to the other side by the end of the day. And the next day he runs the same race again. You can't miss it. And there's nothing hid from the, from the heat thereof. The light and the heat of the sun sustain our lives. The heavens declare the glory of God. He's not hiding from us hiding from us. Now there's a second evidence given here. In verses 7 to 11, God's glory is proclaimed in His Word in the Holy Scriptures. So begin with in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So pause a minute, just like we reflected about the heavens and the sun, reflect about the nature of the Bible. What other book do you know that is perfect, always sure, right, pure, clean, true and righteous altogether? No error, no mistake. What other book <coughs> gives the perfect guidance that the Bible gives for our life? What other book has the power to convert the soul and to give wisdom even to the humble, the simple of heart. What other book fills our hearts with such joy? Just before Don and I left last night, we visited a brother in the church at home that's on his deathbed. And I was reminded as we read Revelation 21 how that he's, he has the understanding of the faith not to be afraid of what he's about to experience in death. When he steps away from this world and into the Hadean realm to the bosom of Abraham, can you imagine the rejoicing of his heart? What other book gives us that gift? What other book enlightens our eyes to so many things? What other book true and righteous altogether. There's no book that compares to the Bible. It proclaims the reality there's a God. And then it's more precious than gold. It's more valuable than gold. And I like what it said in verse 11. Think about the warnings in the Bible. Now some people say, well, we shouldn't have negative preaching. Well, actually, negative truth, if it's presented in the right way, is one of the greatest gifts we can have. <coughs> Were we not strict with our children? Don't play in the street. Don't shoot each other with a BB gun. I mean, we give those warnings not to oppress people. And the Bible is not oppressing us. It's warning us so that we do not damage and destroy our souls. What other book does that in the way the Bible does it? And not only that, but there are great rewards on the other side of the coin. 
Think of the tremendous blessings that we have. And the longer that we live and follow the Bible, the more we see those blessings. We can see our children, if they also learn the truth, walking in the truth. And then if they teach our grandchildren, we see them walking in the truth, the rewards become more and more, don't they? There are people here that have experienced what I'm saying. Think about all the sexually transmitted diseases, and we just go through one cycle after another in the United States of having a plague of these diseases. But if you learn from the Bible that God teaches marriage is one man for one woman for life, period, you can't get a sexually transmitted disease. Think in how many ways the instruction of the Bible rewards us. You can never become an alcoholic if you never take the first drink. And the Bible will teach you not to do that. There are great rewards. The Bible is proclaiming the true and the living God. Now, he closes this psalm with a prayer for a right relationship with God, and this can be your prayer and my prayer. In verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. As we approach God in prayer, we would ask cleansing from our sins, and through his word and providence, he can help us to see those sins so that we do turn from them. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, meaning a stubborn heart. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. We pray to God to keep our hearts humble and tender and not to become stubborn and arrogant. And then let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That prayer is your prayer. There is a true and a living God. Now, I want to think about summarizing some evidences as we go just a little bit deeper on the subject. We're going to talk about cause and effect, the creator and the creation. I want to study a few minutes intelligent design, which means there has to be an intelligent designer. We'll talk about man's capacity to worship God as proof there is a God. And then last, we want to touch on this. Why are men denying God? With so much overwhelming evidence, why would anyone deny God? So let's go to the first. Cause and effect. The creator and the creation. This is called the cosmological argument. It means the universe must have an adequate cause. Cosmology, from the Greek word cosmos, order, form, the world as an ordered whole. And the Legea part added there is just to study something. So what it's saying is step back and study the order of the universe. The universe is not just random floating junk. It's an orderly creation. How come? So every effect must have an adequate cause. If we put a basketball in the middle of the floor, it will be stationary unless something makes it move. There has to be an adequate cause for every effect. If that basketball moves, something made it move. All right, this is not rocket science, is it? Something comes from something, and nothing comes from nothing. Not rocket science, not complicated. Any person can understand it. All right, so the cosmos exists. And just like the basketball can't move unless there's an adequate cause, the universe cannot exist unless there is an adequate cause. So who or what is that adequate cause? That's what I want to think about. Just a few moments. Go back to Hebrews 3, 3 and 4. It states a common principle that we all understand intuitively. The architect, or even the builder of a house, or a man who starts a good family, 
or a man who establishes a great nation. Such people are greater than the work they do. Greater than the work they do. Now this is talking about comparing Christ and Moses. Hebrews 3, 3 to 4. For this man, Christ, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Why does he have more glory? Inasmuch as he who had built the house hath more honor than the house. You see, Moses was just a servant in God's family or God's house. But Christ is God. He's the builder of the house. He's greater than Moses, isn't he? And then that intuitive truth in verse 4, every house is built by some man. Right. We're looking at this church building and nobody here would believe that an accidental, random explosion out in the woods produced such a church building as this. And the universe is more beautiful and more complex a million times more than this building. He that built all things is God. That's the only adequate explanation for the universe. <clears throat> all right, let's go to the simple illustration of a watch. Now, if a watch is an evidence of the maker, how much more is the cosmos or the universe evidence of God? Or think about your iPhone or a computer. The complexity of that instrument, all the working parts, that's evidence of a maker, right? The universe is more complex than a watch, more complex than an iPhone, more complex than a computer. Seems to me that would be evidence of, of uh, what? There's a maker somewhere. There sure is. Has to be. So, God is the first cause. Now there are times people ask, and it's not always a sneering question, sometimes it's an honest question. Where did God come from? Well, the answer is that God is the uncaused cause. No one created God. He's from eternity. And so when the Bible starts, it doesn't actually make an elaborate argument to prove there is a God. It just starts with the reality there is a God. Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God, He's already there, created the heavens and the earth, which was not there. So that means the material things were not eternal. The God who created those things is eternal. So I'm going to change this now, put it in the way of a question. Which is the more reasonable first cause? The eternal God or the eternal matter? Now there are actually many religions as well as atheists who believe the origin of the universe is the universe itself. Hindu and Buddhism and others teach that the universe created itself and then it just kind of implodes and starts over and does it again. So it's always been here in some form. So let's, let's see which one is more reasonable. We're going to look at eternal God or eternal matter. If eternal God is the uncaused cause, first cause, then you have an intelligent creator. But if eternal matter is the first cause, like a rock would be matter, then the first cause is non-intelligent. Just to stay with the rock for the sake of illustration, what intelligence does a rock have? I taught a lot of students in high school, but I never did try to teach a rock. It doesn't have intelligence, right? All right, so which one would be more reasonable? Now, if eternal God, then the Creator has the power to will, to plan, to purpose. That makes sense, all right? But if eternal matter is the first cause, but does the rock have power to plan or to will anything? It doesn't. Uh, to me, this is not reasonable to think that the universe originated from eternal matter. All right, if it would be eternal God is the first cause, then he has all wisdom, and it would make sense that he could create this universe. 
But if matter, if the rock, is the origin of everything, but it has no wisdom. What wisdom is in a rock? Did you ever ask a rock for advice? There's no wisdom in matter. All right, if God is the first cause, he has infinite power to fulfill his plan and his purpose in the creation. If matter is the first cause, but matter has no power to fulfill its no plan. It can't make a plan, and it has no power to fulfill a plan. So why is that reasonable? I don't see that as reasonable. All right, if eternal God is the first cause, he has infinite love and goodwill. He is conscious of us and shows his care over us. The first cause. Would, would that make some sense? When I look at the blessings that surround me in this universe. But if matter <coughs> is the first cause, it has no love, no compassion, no goodwill. So how do we explain all the blessings that we receive? So you have to be the one that decides which is more reasonable. Now, matter and energy cannot be the right answer. They're not <coughs> eternal, they're finite. They're finite. If you study even an elementary science course, you're going to hear about the second law of thermodynamics. And it says this, the universe is growing old, wearing down, running down, you ultimately to burn itself out. But the Bible said that in 2 Peter 3.10. That the universe is not going to continue to exist. God will bring it to an end when His purpose is finished. The material universe cannot perpetuate itself. And here it is in 2 Peter 3 now in verse 10. <clears throat> Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The universe is not eternal. It's finite. It's temporal. So it cannot be the explanation of how the universe got here and how we got here. All right, please consider another line of evidence. Did you notice we're not just making an emotional appeal and we're not talking about what our grandmother believed, though she might have been a very good person, but we're looking at evidence. Intelligent design means there's an intelligent designer. This is called the teleological argument. The design and the order of the universe require an intelligent designer. Now that word, teleology, comes from Greek telos. It just means something that has an end in the sense of a purpose or a design. A watch has a purpose. All right, a computer has a purpose. Your automobile has a purpose. Right? It's designed with a purpose. It's not just something random out here. And again, Legea is to study. So look at the universe and notice if it has the marks of having been designed. <coughs> because if it has the marks of having been designed, there has to be what? A designer. And the universe does reflect order and design. The universe is not just something as random chance. And one of the things that impresses me to get that point, when we started space exploration, if everything is just in random, you would not send somebody up in a space capsule because he'd crash the first minute he got up there. But it's not in random. The scientists are able to study and know with precision where every object up there will be any moment. And that's why you can send a space capsule and guide him safely and bring him back. So there's something here that says cosmos order, design in this universe. So think with me on this a little bit more. The universe functions in a precise way, an orderly way. It shows system. 
systematic, is productive in the way that it functions. And we're going to look at some examples. Plant life, animal life, human life reproduce after their kind. And we all know that, but I want to ask, why does it work that way? Why does it work that way? Genesis 1 verse 11, God created plant life and every plant reproduced after his kind. So if you, if you plant a tomato seed, do you ever get an orange tree? <clears throat> of course you don't, but what I want to ask you is, why? If the universe is just random, why not you can plant an orange seed and get a tomato plant? All right? Uh, verse 21 said that when God created the whales and the fish and then the birds, they reproduced after their kind. So, again, you know that, but ask yourself, why is it like that? So why does a bird egg never hatch a whale? We know it doesn't, but why? There's evidence of design. All right, verse 24, when God created every living creature, meaning the animals, cattle, and so on, they reproduce after his kind. So again, why does a rabbit never produce a turtle? And why does a turtle never produce a rabbit? We know how it works, but I'm just trying to press us to think, why does it work this way? Could it be somebody designed it to work this way? Could it be? What do you think? Yeah. All right. Verses 27 and 28, you know that God created man in his image, male and female created he them, and God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so how do we reproduce? Well, we don't reproduce a turtle. We don't reproduce a cat. Every time it's another human. We know that, but W-H-Y. Does it look like it was designed to work that way? It really does. And if it's designed, it has to have what? A designer. All right? Let's think about the seasons. We're right in the middle of the beautiful fall season. The cycles and seasons of nature sustain our lives. Um, wonder why it works that way. Genesis 8, 22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. There's an orderly progression, and the seasons repeat in the same progression every year, don't they? Had you ever thought to ask why? Would it look like somebody designed it to repeat in that sequence? I believe it would. All right, something else about order. Let's look in Psalm 147. Nature functions in a sequential way to sustain our life. The sequence is necessary. All right, just, just like a watch moves in a sequential way. All right, Psalm 147, verse 7 says that we ought to give praise unto the Lord because in verse 8 he covers the heavens with clouds to prepare rain for the earth to make the grass grow so that in verse 9 the animals have food to eat. And we eat both plants and the animals. And I notice the systematic way that it all works. You have the water vapor in the sky. What do we call that? Clouds. But some of it falls down on the earth. What do we call that? Rain. And why do we need rain? The plants die without it. Well, why do we need plants? The animals can't live without it. And we can't live without it. And after it runs that little cycle, what does it do next? Evaporate. Remember that word? It evaporates and runs the same cycle again. Huh. I'm beginning to suspect somebody arranged it to work that way. What do you think? Hmm? All right. Now the earth is tilted at a right angle. Did you know the earth is not upright in the heavens? 
it's leaning 23 degrees. And that's necessary to sustain life. But who knew that was necessary to do that? Who knew that? I don't think John knew that. I don't think Clint knew that. I can tell you I didn't know that. I wonder who knew that. Why is it not 30 degrees or 10 degrees? There's an answer to that why. Someone designed this universe in that way. Right? The earth rotates once a day on its axis, moving at the right speed, which is 1,040 miles per hour. Hmm. Who set that cruise control? Huh? Really, think about that. The earth moves exactly at that speed, and it must move at that speed to sustain life. Somebody set the cruise control. Now, it orbits the sun once a year at the speed of 18 and a half miles per second. And who set that cruise control? Was it me? I don't think it was you. But somebody did do that. There's an answer to why. You know, that is interesting. Here the moon is moving around the earth. And both the moon and the earth moving around the sun. This is clear evidence of design. This is not random. It's not like throwing a bucket of marbles on the floor to just see where they'll go. Right? There has to be a designer. I'm not appealing to your emotion. I'm not appealing to your grandmother. I'm offering rock solid evidence of design which proves there must be a designer. All right, let's go further on this. The sun is set at the right temperature. What is the right temperature? 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, 27 million at the core. Well, who knew that? Who knew to set it at that temperature? You know, well, we have a device where we set the temperature, don't we? So who set that temperature? And by the way, we read in the Psalms how that the earth depends on that light and that heat. And somebody had to set that in the right way. Now, if, if the sun was cooler, what would happen to us? Yeah, that's right, we'd freeze. And if the sun was hotter, what would happen to us? That's right, we'd burn up. So someone had to know the precise temperature setting. <clears throat> Who knew that? And there can only be one answer. There's a living God. Think of this. The moon is the right distance from the earth. It moves an elliptical pattern in an oval orbit. Not in a perfect circle. 221,463 miles from the earth at the closest point. 251,968 miles at the furthest point. So while we're going around the sun and the moon is making an elliptical orbit around us. Folks, there's no disputing that was designed that way. Now there is God. Don't ever doubt it. Don't ever question it. There's the God. The Earth's atmosphere creates a bubble of air where we live. And if we get outside that bubble, we can't live. So it sustains life. And it even affects the temperature changes and the weather patterns. And it's 248 miles high or thick. And who knew how to set it that way? Why? Is that just accidental? That's not accidental. God exists. All right, next, the crust of the earth is about six miles thick under the ocean. On the continents, it's an average of 35 miles thick. Have you ever even thought about such a thing? Somebody knew how to design the thickness of the crust of the earth in the ocean and, and where the continents are. How come? Why? Folks, are all of the things that we're touching here just random things? They're not random. 
and they cannot be accidental any more than your watch is an accident or your iPhone is an accident. Now there's a designer. The oceans are the right depth, average of 2.6 miles deep, and the deepest point about 7 miles. Again, I want to know why. That's necessary to sustain our life. Somebody made it exactly that way. All right, we could go on and on, but you got the point. Now, I want to put one more on the table, but we won't explore it fully. There are, God only knows, how many multiplied thousands of instincts that guide the animals. Things like the birds migrating, things like fish and their movements is by instinct. And here's one that really got my attention. The herring gull would sometimes die and leave eggs, and scientists would try to incubate those eggs and get a chick, and it would die every time, even though they were using the right procedure. So what they had to do was just, by observation, they tried to watch what goes on in the interaction between a chick and the mother. And they found out there's a small red dot under the beak of the mother, and the, the chick will not accept food until it touches that red dot. Now why in the world that instinct is there, nobody knows. We can figure out some of the instincts and, and how they work and why, but this one, we don't know. But my point is this, it works that way with every single chick. The other birds don't do that. Just this bird. Somebody designed it to work that way. And the more you explore nature, it's full of things like this. Don't you ever doubt or fear it. There is a God, a true and a living God. All right, let's move quickly to this. Man's capacity to worship God proves there is a God. Did you ever thought about that? And why that's true? This is called the ontological argument that man's capacity to worship God is evidence there must be a God. Alright, let's think about it. Ontology is from a Greek word on ontos. It just means that which has being, that which exists. And so you study the nature of what exists and you begin to learn some things. Alright, so the evidence of God's existence in this case is man's unique capacity to seek after, to love, to want to worship God. Now if you say, well, I'm not sure, would that really be an evidence of God? Think of this. This is universal. You can't find a tribe of people, even a remote place, that doesn't have that experience. So again, how come? Where did this come from? That there's something in man that keeps searching and reaching. Uh, where is God? Who is God? What is God? There's a capacity there asking to be filled. Think about it. All right. How did it get that way? Think about it this way. The existence of some things is evidence of corresponding things. <coughs> We sometimes talk about parts and counterparts. All right? So do that with me. We'll do this briefly. The existence of males implies what? When God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, you not only must have a male, you must have what? You must have the counterpart, which is a female. No escaping this. So Genesis 1, 27, 28, that's what you have. He created a male, he created a female, now he said be fruitful and multiply. All right. Part and counterpart. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 6, which is teaching us not to commit adultery, and it made this approach in verse 13. Meats, or in other words, food, for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. 
So my body and the food I eat is temporal. It will pass away. But the point here is being made. I have a belly. Why do I have a belly? Why do I have a belly? I'm glad I do. But why do I have a belly? Do I have a belly because it's designed? Did you put food there? Yes. You don't put rocks in your belly, do you? I hope you don't. But food, food, you, you thrive if you can put food in your belly. Especially bluebell ice cream in that right stand. Don't forget to get some bluebell ice cream. All right, now Paul is making a serious point and it sticks. It's a true point. The existence of the belly implies the necessity that food exists. Now I'll stay with the same verse because here's the application Paul made. Now the body is not for fornication. What was it for? For the Lord and the Lord for the body. What he's saying, if you have a body, it's because God made your body. And if God made your body, then God has a purpose for your body. Right? Correct. And that's a powerful argument of why fornication and adultery are an abomination. God did not create the human body to experience fornication and adultery. Think about that. It's abusing the body just as much as putting rocks in your stomach. Rocks in your stomach will be a disaster to your life in the physical way. Fornication and adultery are a fiasco. They never produce happiness and stability in people's lives. Never. Because the body implies the need of God to tell you what it's for. Alright, so part and counterpart, are we catching that? Look at Ecclesiastes 3.11. I'm going to use the New International. It's, te it's teaching us that God gave man an innate capacity to think about eternity. So why do we think about eternity? It said he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, if they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to end. I don't know everything about God. He's in eternity. But I sure do seek to know about God. And here's one evidence that that, that is the common nature of mankind. If you have several dogs in your house, and one of those dogs gets run over by a car, do the other dogs conduct a funeral service? Huh? Have you ever seen a bunch of dogs at a funeral service? Bury their loved one? Now, it sounds like a humorous illustration, but I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to ask, why do we have funerals with dogs don't? Why is that? It's because dogs don't think about what's next. They don't think about eternity. Well, how come we have that capacity? There has to be a reason. Just as much as the belly is for food, your capacity to think about eternity is because eternity is there and God is there. That's right. That's irrefutable. Man has a uniquely religious nature. No other creature has that. We're always seeking God. It's not always in the right way, but there is that seeking. And people seek for what is right, what is good, what is true, and they debate all of that. There's something in man that's reaching out and seeking those things that can only be explained in one way. There is a God who answers that need. There is food that answers the need of the belly. There is a God that answers the need of your spirit that's reaching out. Who am I? Why am I here? What is next when I die? <coughs> part and counterpart. This corresponds to that. Male corresponds to what? Female, right. 
Belly corresponds to what? Food. Okay. Our body corresponds to what? The Lord made it. He's there to guide the use of the body. Now, we seek eternity. The rocks don't do that. The dogs don't do that. Why do we do that? The counterpart to our seeking eternity, eternity is there. The God of eternity is there. And so, our capacity for God is proof there is a God. Just as surely as your capacity for food implies there is food. Truly there's a God. So why will men deny God? Just give me a few moments. Let's touch on that and we'll close the lesson. Can you think of historically two times in the history of the world every living person believed in the true God? There have been two times. What was the first? All right, yes, at the beginning, Adam and Eve knew it. There's just one true God. Their children knew it. Well, what happened later? What happened? Now, when was the second time that every living creature knew the true God? When? Yes, right after the flood. In Noah's time. Noah and his wife and their children, they knew it. Well, then what happened in the passing of time? In both cases, men rejected God, and Romans 1.21 explains how that happened. How did they drift away? How is it possible that men do that? Ingratitude and pride lead us away from our God. <coughs> Romans 1.21 Because that, when they knew God, there was a time they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain <coughs> in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Man begins to think he's smarter than God, and man makes his own God. And it's ingratitude, and it's vain pride. And this is how we are led away from God. Now I bring that up to say this. We live in a world where the descendants of those people for all of these generations have been led away from God in many different forms and fashions. And that's why what we're doing this week is so vitally important. You cannot name anything more important than helping people know there's a true God and how to get in the lifeboat to save their soul from hell. Thank God for what you have planned to do in this week's work. Now, I'm going to tell you another reason that I've encountered that people become unbelievers. They are disappointed by false religions. I want to tell you, like putting rocks in your belly, false religion in your soul will not satisfy your soul. It just won't. Judah was warned in Isaiah 36, verse 6, about that splintered reed of a staff, referring to Egypt, which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. In other words, if you lean on a broken <coughs> rod, it will pierce your hand. Did you know false religion is like that? And we encounter people that abandon these religions, and I'm going to speak frankly, but not in a way to embarrass people. I'm just calling to your attention something you already know. That many Roman Catholics have been disappointed by their religion teaching. That the hierarchy is not to marry and then come to find out because they're not married, they're preying on young boys sexually. And what I'm saying is people walk away from those churches disappointed. They thought they believed in God, but if this is what God is all about, how can I believe in God? There are people, and especially many young people in our generation, that are leaving the churches by droves because the churches are not teaching them the evidence for God. They're being told, there's a God, there's a God, glory, hallelujah, there's a God. 
Well, how, what's the evidence of God? That's not being addressed. And they get a point where the bubble pops. I'm tired of shouting, there's a God, and nobody can show me why there's a God. False religion produces ultimately unbelievers in many cases. Next, some men have not considered the evidence. And there again, this is why we try to study and equip ourselves to share the truth of God. In Psalm 19 and 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and so that message is always available. And we need to challenge men to look at the evidence. That's what we're trying to do even tonight. Now, in some cases, but not all cases, men actually close their eyes when you present the evidence. 2 Peter 3, 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, pray tell why when you show love to somebody in your family, maybe one of your acquaintances, to try to show them there's a true God? Why would they push you away? Why would somebody do that? And here's the answer to it. The love of sin is the root cause that turns people away from acknowledging God. And that's found in Psalm 14, which we often quote, but sometimes we don't quite finish the quotation. And the point here is that men deny God to ease their conscience. To ease their conscience. If there's no God, I will not answer for my sins. No, I, I'm not responsible. I can drink, I can take drugs, I can fornicate, I can lie. I can cheat, I can gamble, I can steal. There's no God. But you see how that would ease the conscience? And here's the passage, Psalm 14. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Did you see why they say it? They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone astray. They are all become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. If I love my sins, I become obsessed with following my sins, I don't want to hear about God. Because if there's a God, I will have to answer to God. And that means I would be cast into hell for my sins. And you see how that men intellectually run away from the consequence of their sins. And they say there's no God. But in spite of this, the universe proclaims every day, every night, in every language, there is a God. The heavens declare the glory of God. And we invite you tonight to submit to the true and the living God. We have seen the evidence, cause, and effect, the Creator and the creation. We have seen if there is intelligent design, there must be what? There must be an intelligent designer. We have seen that man's capacity to worship God proves there is a God. Just like your belly proves there is food to fill that capacity. And we've seen why men deny God. So tonight, before we close, we offer the Lord's invitation. Knowing that sin is the iceberg that will shipwreck your soul and take you to a devil's hell. But there is hope. There's no need for a single person to be lost in hell. God loves you and sent Jesus to save you from your sins. He died on the cross. And based on that perfect sacrifice, He wants to forgive your sin but you must get in the lifeboat. We must get in the lifeboat. The Lord is waiting and inviting us to seek Him and come to Him. When Jesus died on the cross and arose, and He sent the apostles out to preach salvation. In Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
Dear friend, you can be saved. There is a God who wants you to be saved. There's a Savior who shed His blood so that you can be saved. Please get in that lifeboat before it is too late. Because the Bible said, He that believeth not shall be damned. We answer for our sins. And especially when we turn our back and walk away from God. Please do not do that tonight. If you need to come by faith and repent of your sins, confess Christ tonight, we're ready to help you. And you can be baptized and go home free from your sin. And when you get in that lifeboat, stay in that lifeboat. Don't ever get out. Don't ever go back. Should there be a Christian falling back into sin, the lifeboat is still there. Come back to the Lord that loves you so. If you're subject to the gospel call, come right now while we stand and sing.